So you've boosted a character in Final Fantasy XIV, or maybe you're thinking about it. Don't worry, I'm not going to bore you with why you should or shouldn't do it, but you probably want to make sure you get a few basic things down before hopping into group content. So consider this my beginner's guide to boosting. Let's get started. First off, in case you're curious about boosting a character in 14 in the first place, there are actually two types of boosts. The first is a job boost, called a One Hero's Journey in the online store. This will level a job on a character up to 10 levels below max, which at the time of this video is level 70. It will provide you with your completed job quests, skills, some equipment, and some items you can sell to any common vendor to earn some gil. Then there are story boosts, or main scenario progression in the online store. These let you skip whichever expansion story is in the title and every expansion beforehand. So if you purchased the Stormblood skip, you would also be skipping Heavensward and A Realm Reborn. It does also come with some more items to sell for gil. The job boost and the highest tier story boost cost 25 US dollars each when not on sale. So boosting a character from absolutely nothing to, at the time of this video, one job at level 70 and level 70 main story progression would run you about 50 bucks, and that'll update as more expansions come out. My advice, if you like healers or casters, grab the summoner or scholar boosts. These will actually get you two jobs leveled for the price of one, but whichever one you don't buy is not going to have gear or any of its job quests completed. To grab your purchased items, find a delivery moogle in any of the three locations shown on the screen once you've made your character. If you have any collector's edition items or anything like that, those will also be here as well. Also, if you eventually do want to go back and do the story that you skipped, there's actually a New Game Plus feature that lets you replay old story quests. It does not reward any experience points, so you're only going to use it to play the actual story. You can unlock this in Western Thanalan at Wistful Whitebeard at the location X12Y14. The unending journey in your in-room will also let you rewatch cutscenes and your story boost will actually drop you there, but not every scene is in there, I'm afraid. So you're in the game with your boosted character. You'll get a pop-up for the Hall of the Novice after you use your job boost, but we'll come back to that. Make sure to grab your gear and sellable items and get equipped. After that, you'll probably want to become a little familiar with the game itself, maybe get familiar with the job skills that you have and your user interface. While you could watch one of my other videos on these things, I'll give you a brief overview now. For user interface settings, you'll want to head to your HUD layout located in your main menu. It can all be moved, size adjusted, and even modified in select ways, such as splitting buffs and debuffs, or changing your job gauge between simple and normal. You can save up to four separate HUD layouts in case you like to change things up per job or for whatever reason. Your character configuration options also have a ton of settings, especially the user interface, display name, and hotbar settings. There's tons of things to check out and fiddle with, and it's all built into the game. I'll actually include a link to my own in-game settings in the description with instructions on how to install and use them on your own character if you're on PC, but I'd recommend just toying around and finding what's best for you. So once you got your hotbars laid out, it's time to figure out where you want to put your skills. Odds are you're going to keep modifying your UI as you figure this out though, so I don't think you're really done with that just yet. I expect most of you to change your setups pretty frequently as you unlock new skills and try to become familiar with things, but I like to identify a few things that I can use as habits between every job. For example, I like to put combo actions in subsequent keys, such as 1, 2, 3, or Shift 1, 2, 3. And the same goes for AOE combos as well, maybe using control modifiers or something. Then I set up any extra buttons I have, extra single target or AOE skills, near these buttons, so that way I make sure everything is kind of segmented. That's just how my brain works. Cooldowns I'll stick on my MMO mouse or on other buttons that have rebound that are comfortable for my hands, and then I usually rebind a few more of them and resize them to track more important abilities. That's what that big hotbar is in the middle of my screen. Shift and control modifiers are big friends of mine, so I use them a lot, even with my mouse buttons, and I rarely go past number 5 on my actual keyboard. You'll have a lot of skills to mess with and figure out where you want to put them, so I recommend finding a training dummy in one of several zones, such as the Summerford Farms Teleport, Western Thanalan, Central Shroud, Western Curthus, and so on and so forth. Use your skills and experiment with your keybinds to find out what fits best. You can also change your keybinds in the main menu, probably should have mentioned that earlier. Now, if you need the simplicities of your role explained to you, hit up the Hall of the Novice that popped up on your screen earlier. You can actually enter it from any NPC sporting this sprout-looking symbol over their head, normally in the main cities and a few other locations around the world. It's really basic MMO stuff, but it gives you solid level 15 gear for that role and a ring that'll increase EXP up to level 30. I know you just boosted a job to 70, but if you want to level any other job under level 30, this is going to be nice to have, the gear and the ring. Speaking of which, since you can play every job on one character, you should probably get used to saving gear sets using the armory system. 
Open this menu up in your character sheet and press the plus button at the top to add your current job to that list. Now anytime you want to swap between jobs, just click these to swap at a moment's notice. You can even drag them onto your hotbar if you want and make another hotbar for swapping jobs instead of coming to this menu. Next, one UI element you've probably noticed now is your scenario guide. This will alert you to the location of your next story quest, which no matter what you did in terms of boosting or not, you're going to have to play through these quests if you want to get to some of the newer stuff. You can skip the cutscenes if you want, and you probably will if you've already skipped the boost up to this point, but I'll leave that up to you. The scenario guide also recommends important quests that you should do. Whenever there's a small quest underneath the big story one, definitely do it ASAP. The one you have after you boost should be a quest that unlocks your chocobo fighting companion, which you can make heal or tank or DPS for any open world content that you're doing. And it also gives you access to the chocobo saddlebag, which gives you some bonus inventory slots when you're not in an instance. If you need even more storage, head to a retainer vocate at a major city. By default, you can hire up to two retainers that can store items, sell them on the market, and eventually even run errands for you and level up. Get involved with them ASAP to save yourself many headaches in the future. And finally, before we start continuing with your actual leveling process, learn to identify quest types. Quest symbols tell you how important a quest is at just a glance. The big meteor symbol looking ones are the main scenario quests, and you'll just be using your scenario guide for those anyway. The blue exclamation mark ones unlock new features, such as dungeons or aesthetics, and the rest are just normal quests. There are some other quest markers for things like repeatable quests or smaller NPC interactions, but they still follow a similar color convention to the normal quests. Alright, so you're all set and ready to start your adventure. Just follow your scenario guide along and complete the quest it recommends. If you want to do side quests, feel free. They do reward some gill and other useful items, but you don't really have to do all of them. The ones in Shadowbringers areas also scale to your level, so you can choose to save them for alternate job leveling if you get that far. Also, any etherites or small ethernets you see, whether they be in cities or zones, attune to them if they'll let you. You can use these to teleport around the world map or cities themselves using the teleport menu or by clicking the etherites or ethernets in town. While you're exploring the world, you'll also want to work on unlocking flying in each zone as soon as possible. Since you boosted, you'll be able to fly in all the old zones from the previous expansions, but in whatever expansions you haven't skipped, you'll need to unlock it. Fortunately, it's not too bad. This will be done by collecting ether currents around the map and also earning some currents from completing several quests in each zone. In order to more quickly find currents, you'll need an ether compass. Since you boosted, you won't have one by default, but fortunately you can quickly grab one by teleporting to Rolger's Reach and speaking to Goffred in this location on the map. He'll give it to you, and then you just have to go to your key items and drag it somewhere on your hotbar so you can press it frequently when you're looking for currents. Mind you that the first two zones you visit in Shadowbringers can't unlock flying on the first visit. You only get to explore about half the map, so don't get hung up on those. You'll usually unlock flying in a zone by the time you finish every main scenario quest in that zone, assuming you've been discovering the currents around the map and doing blue exclamation mark quests that reward currents as well. Now when you hit level 71, or sometime after you hit 71, you'll gain access to a dungeon, Holminster Switch. This is the first dungeon you can do that allows you to access the trust option. This lets you run the dungeon with NPCs instead of other players, at the cost of the NPCs being inferior to players, at least on average. This is the perfect opportunity for you to practice your job or role before getting into any group content with other players. I definitely recommend waiting for Holminster Switch instead of hopping into low-level dungeons that are in your duty finder before you actually are used to any of your skills or anything like that. Either you'll be queuing into low-level stuff where you don't have all your skills and you can't get used to it, or you'll be queuing into things that are maybe a little bit too confusing if you don't understand the game just yet. I definitely recommend just repeating Holminster Switch as much as possible with your trusts until you feel more comfortable. You'll need to access the trust menu in your duty options to repeat it after the first time, as shown on the screen, but after that, you can go nuts. Now while doing the dungeon, take your time to understand the various markers and game systems that are present. You know, understand that on big groups you want to AoE monsters, on bosses you want to focus on your single target skills. Make sure if you're a tank you're using your cooldowns, your defensive ones. Make sure you're not leaving your offensive abilities untouched as well. Just try to understand where all of your buttons function in any given fight. Also look at what the bosses are doing. There's markers that deal stack damage. They look very similar in every fight in the game. Identify what a tank buster looks like or how you can predict that one is coming, and the same with room-wide attacks. Learn to use the aggro list or the focus target keybinds to keep track of what the enemies are casting. 
then more advanced things such as numbered markers or enemies raising an arm to mean that you should, probably shouldn't stand on that side of the room. There's lots of little things that you can look at and see here that'll be pretty consistent across the rest of the game. And this is only one dungeon. I mean, from this point on, the process just kind of repeats itself until max level. Treat every dungeon kind of similarly and you'll pick up a lot along the way. You'll have a few eight-man bosses along the way as well, a ton of solo instances, and then a more handful of dungeons. Try to keep your gear up to date from quests and dungeons along the way, and you'll be A-OK. -okay. Once you hit 80, the game opens up a ton. I could go on for this section for an hour, but since I'm making this video at the end of the expansion, I'm just going to give you a few recommendations before Endwalker releases. First, get some gear. You'll probably be around item level 430 when you finish the initial level 80 story quest, but you got several more patches of story quests to do before you're caught up for Endwalker. You have the option to buy gear off the market board, earn it from dungeons or raids, or farm tombstones, which is like an endgame currency, and you earn it from a ton of endgame activities such as dungeons in order to buy upgrades for your gear. Allegory tombstones give item level 490 stuff, and the weekly capped revelation tombstones give item level 520 stuff, which can then be further upgraded to 530 with items from various activities such as raids. The fastest way to a raid ready item level is to buy item level 510 gear off the market board. Only ever buy HQ gear when purchasing it for upgrades. Normal quality gear has significantly worse stats and should be saved for things like glamour. You can buy a full set of item level 510 gear, which immediately puts you at a high enough item level to tackle anything in the game really, though just barely for the more recent stuff. It will cost you a pretty penny though, but fortunately you should have a decent amount of gil from getting to level 80. That 510 stuff can even be upgraded to item level 520. Purchase crystalline reigns for 100 allegory tomes apiece and trade in your HQ item level 510 gear for tokens. It's kind of convoluted though, so be careful going through the menus if you're going to opt into this. But that's not it. The most recent tier of raids are also great for gear. The normal 8-man raid Eden's Promise gives tokens to exchange for item level 510 gear and the Savage difficulty gives item level 530. You'll want some basic item level 510 stuff before attempting Savage and before you can even get to Eden's Promise, you'll have to do a few of the previous raid tiers that have come out. The 24-man raid for Shadowbringers also gives some decent gear. The Tower at Paradigm's Breach, the most recent one, drops item level 520 gear with upgrade materials for the Revelation Tombstone gear to take that to item level 530. Although you'll need to do all the 24-mans, I guess, to do that. Finally, there's Bojja. This series comes with a number of activities that reward up to item level 525 gear and even the best weapon in the Shadowbringers expansion, the Resistance Weapon. You'll need to backtrack and complete the Stormblood 24-man raid series to access it, but it requires no item level to participate, so you wouldn't have to buy anything to get into this, and can even be used to level alternate jobs from level 71 to 80 very effectively. There are also extreme trials, which can just net you weapons along the way. Only the most recent one's going to have that important of an item level for weapons, and there is one extreme trial that drops some gear, but it's largely outdated stuff at this point. That's going to be an activity that you just decide to tackle as someone who's trying to learn more about the game, or maybe farm a specific mount from one of them. Now, on all the gear you're getting, you probably notice they have some slots on them. You can actually affix jewels called Materia to these slots to improve your stats up to a specific value using a process called melding. It's really just a couple of button presses, but as a boosted character, you may notice that the Materia melders in the towns won't actually let you access this process. You're going to have to go do a couple of quests in order to make sure you have more of the Materia-related stuff unlocked. Teleport to Camp Blackbrush in Central Thanalan and head to a small goblin camp to the north. Complete the non-locked quests there to get melding, transmuting, and extracting actions for materia. The locked quest requires you to have a low-level crafter and is used to unlock a more advanced melding process that you shouldn't have to worry about as the time you're watching this video. You can always find another video on that process and it'll be relevant eventually, but not right now. Now that you have it unlocked, you can go to most major locales in the more recent expansions, Rolgers, Reach, Yulemore, any of those locations, and you'll find Materia Melder NPCs that will speak to you now that you've completed those quests. Use these to affix stats onto your armor, but be wary if it says the stat cannot be increased anymore. If you pick up Materia while leveling, throw it on there, and before getting into any serious endgame activity, be sure to load up on Materia on your gear as well. Ask around for melding advice and either buy or earn Materia in a number of different ways. Now there's a million and one things I could steer you towards from here, but I think this just covers the basics that you probably need to know or want to know if you just boost it. I have a ton of videos, some more directly on some new player stuff we've been doing lately, some more on older activities that are still relevant. Browse around my channel and if you need a video on something, odds are I have you covered. If not, I'm sure one of the other amazing content creators this game has will get you covered instead. But that's going to be a wrap for my video on 
I guess, my beginner's guide for boosting in Final Fantasy XIV. If you have more questions, be sure to stop by my live stream. I stream every day from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific. It's not always Final Fantasy XIV, but even if I'm not playing it, feel free to hop in and ask a question or just come by and enjoy any of the other games I might be trying out on my live stream. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share for this video, this channel. There's going to be a ton of content coming out before Endwalker and after. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. And until then, take care.